Hi, I'm Christopher Walker with Closely Observed Teaching, and in this video I'm going to read to you a poem by Gerard Knowles Trinité called The Chaos. This was written back in 1920. There are a variety of different versions um, available on the internet. This is, I think, kind of the medium length version. The idea here is that it's uh, a poem written to show just how difficult English pronunciation can be. So I'm going to read it to you um, slowly going through each of the slides that I've put together in this uh, PowerPoint presentation. And then I'm going to share some reflections on the poem and um, if it's appropriate for use in the EFL classroom at the end. Um, if you decide that you'd like to use this poem in your own classroom, I've made the PowerPoint available as a free download on my Teachers Pay Teachers uh, shop. Uh, the link for that is in the description to the video itself. So as I say, it's a free download. It's quite a large download, even though it's quite a short PowerPoint, because I've still not figured out how to condense PowerPoints when I have so many images, as you can see here. But if you want to use it in the classroom, this is now a public domain text, I believe. So you can just grab it off any of the many websites that host it. Uh, I've tried to tidy it up a little bit, make it a little bit more presentable for the classroom for you. So that file is there. So uh, I'll go through it first. Um, hopefully I won't make any glaring mistakes. If I do, feel free to add a comment at the end uh, or uh, below the video. And um, as I say, I'll be coming to some teaching kind of reflections towards the end. Dearest creature in creation, studying English pronunciation. I will teach you in my verse, sounds like corpse, core horse and worse. I will keep you, Susie, busy, make your head with heat grow dizzy. Tear and I, your dress will tear, so shall I, oh hear my prayer. Just compare heart, beard and herd, dies and diet, lord and word. Sword and sword, retain and Britain, mind the latter how it's written. Now I surely will not plague you with such words as plaque and ague, but be careful how you speak. Say break and stake, but bleak and streak. Clove and oven, how and low. Script, receipt, show poem and toe. Hear me say, devoid of trickery. Daughter, laughter and terpsichore. Typhoid, measles, topsails, isles. Exile, simile and reviles. Scholar, vicar and cigar. Solar, mica, war and far. One, anemone, balmoral. Kitchen, lichen, laundry, laurel. Gertrude, German, wind and mind. Seen, melpomene, mankind. Billet does not rhyme with ballet. Okay, wallet, mallet, chalet. Blood and flood are not like food, nor is mould like should and would. Viscous, viscount, load and broad. Toward, to forward, to reward. And your pronunciation's okay when you correctly say croquet. Rounded, wounded, grieve and sieve. Friend and fiend, alive and live. Ivy, privy, famous. Clamour and enamour rhyme with hammer. River, rival, tomb, bomb, comb. Dole and roll and sum and home. Stranger does not rhyme with anger. Neither does devour with clangor. Souls but foul, haunt but aren't. Font, front, want, want, grand and grant. Shoes, goes, does. Now first say finger, and then say singer, ginger, linger. Real, zeal, mauve, gauze, gouge and gauge. Marriage foliage, mirage, and age. Query does not rhyme with very, nor does fury sound like berry. Dost, lost, post, and doth, cloth, loaf. Job, knob, buzzum, transom, oath. Though the differences seem little, we, act, we say actual, but vital. Refer does not rhyme with defer, Pepper does and zephyr, heifer. Mint, pint, senate and sedate. Dull, bull and George ate late. 
Scenic Arabic Pacific. Science Conscience Scientific. Liberty Library Heave and Heaven. Rachel Ake Mustache Eleven. We say hallowed but allowed. People leopard toad but vowed. Mark the differences, moreover, between mover, cover, clover. Leeches, breeches, wise, precise. Chalice, but police and lice. Camel, constable, unstable. Principal, disciple, label. Petal, panel and canal. Wait, surprise. Plat, promise, pal. Worm and storm, chaise, chaos, chair. Senator, spectator, mayor. Tor, but hour and sucker, bore. Gas, alas, and Arkansas. Sea, idea, career, area. Psalm, Maria, but malaria. Youth, south, southern, cleanse and clean. Doctrine, turpentine, marine. Compare alien with Italian. Dandelion and battalion. Sally with ally, yea and ye. I, 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 way and key. Say a verb, but ever fever, neither leisure, skein, deceiver. Heron, granary, canary, crevice and device and airy. Face, but preface, not a face. Phlegm, phlegmatic, ask, glass, base. Large, but target, gin, give, verging. Ought, out, joust and scour. Scourging. Ear but earn and wear and tear. Do not rhyme with ear but air. Seven is right, but so is even. Hyphen, roughen, nephew, Stephen. Monkey, donkey, turk and jerk. Ask, grasp, wasp and cork and work. Pronunciation, think of psyche, is a paling, stout and spiky. Won't it make you lose your wits writing groats and saying grits? It's a dark abyss or tunnel strewn with stone, stowed solace, gunnel. Islington and Isle of Wight, housewife, verdict and indict. Finally, which rhymes with enough? Though, through, plough or dough or cough? Hiccup has the sound of cup. My advice is to give up. Okay, and that's the end of this version of the poem. I think there is a longer version out there, but who would want to read it? My goodness. So, a few thoughts and reflections on the use of this in the EFL classroom. Now, this poem actually first came to my attention only very recently when one of my students showed it to me. She had been given this poem as a homework. She had to read through it and learn how to say every single line of verse. Then her teacher would ask her and students in her class to read different verses of it and they would lose a point for every word they mispronounced. It seems like quite a tricky task if you ask me and I wondered a little bit if there was much point to it but now that I've spent a bit of time with the poem I see that there is a little bit more to it than meets the eye. It is interesting and I think that it kind of um, works well with the students who think that English pronunciation is irregular and quite difficult. But therein lies the danger. For you see, first of all, a lot of decisions were made by the writer of this poem. The first decision was um, to go with a standardized or received pronunciation of certain words. And this is mostly the Southern or Eng uh, like London accent. So for example, uh, glass could be pronounced as glass, depending on where you are in the country or where you are in the English speaking world. Neither one is more correct than the other, but only one of them would fit in the poem. The other thing that I noticed in the poem was that sometimes the pronunciation of, um, for example, the noun was used instead of the verb. So when we had uh, wind and mind, wind could also be that action of winding. So we have the verb to wind. So obviously um, that could cause confusion for students when they encounter the verb instead of the noun, they might go with the pronunciation they expect from the poem for the noun itself. So there is that aspect to consider as well. There are a few areas in the poem where those two things um, happen. 
The other thing to consider when you decide or decide not to show this to your students or to make it a feature of your lesson is that it is a highlighting package for the irregularity of English pronunciation. But is that really um, illustrative of the language? I don't think so. I think that English is a much more regular language than people give it credit for. One of the first things that students encounter as they're learning English as a foreign or second language is the long list of irregular verbs. But they're irregular because they are historical. All of these old verbs like eat, so you have eat, ate, eaten, they're irregular because they've been with us since the very early days of the English language. When English, um, as in Chaucer's English or before Chaucer's, Be Beowulf's English, this was the a language that we don't really have anymore. I don't know if you've ever watched the TV show Vikings, but in the first couple of seasons, when there were Viking invasions of the north of England, the people there in the monasteries were speaking a form of English that I couldn't understand at all. I needed the subtitles. I'm sure that's true for most English speakers. These um, old archaic forms come from a kind of pre-English English. So the same is true with a lot of these unusual words. They come from other places that aren't standardized. If you have any new verb that enters the English language now, for example, download, you download an app to your phone, that verb is guaranteed to be uh, regular. So download, downloaded, downloaded. We have regularity of our spelling system, basically, irregularity uh, where there are variations or where the word is derived from something historical but regularity otherwise so the language is a lot more regular than students would perhaps get and some students might find this poem intimidating and off-putting not only in terms of the poem itself but in terms of English they'll go through and start to go I'm never going to learn this how am I going to be able to know it and I suppose this is the difference between uh, introducing something to them that is generative versus non-generative. This poem is an example of non-generative language. You need to know how to pronounce these words, but knowing how to pronounce these words, or at least some of them, terpsichore, it's the first time I ever saw that, some of these words are not going to be used um, outside of the spelling that we see here. So, for example, we had indict, where well, you have that dict part. Okay, so does that mean if I need to check a ver, a, a ver, a, do I need to check, if I need to check a word, do I go and reach for the dictionary? No, it's the dictionary, because usually that D-I-C-T is pronounced dict. We talk about your diction, um, an edict coming from above, the dictionary, obviously. So these irregular pronunciations uh, don't reveal a greater truth about that collection of words or how they work. Some things are completely, um, actually less irregular than you'd think. Going from phlegm to phlegmatic, that sort of system change is actually more predictable than you would think. So, to sum up, I would say that this is an interesting poem and some of your students might like it in the same way that they like tongue twisters. I found it a challenge to go through. And I was honest with my students when uh, we did this in our individual lesson with my one-to-ones. I always let the students dictate. If they want to do something, we do it, even if I worry about the, the usefulness of it. I found it a challenge and I found myself reaching for um, a good dictionary like the Merriam-Webster online dictionary quite often. Um, you know, we had the lesson over Zoom, so I was lucky because I wasn't sharing my computer sound. So my student would see a word and I'd see it as top sales and I'd be like, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's top sales. And then I'd go into another tab, open up Merriam-Webster, type it in, click the audio button and I'd hear it. But my student wouldn't. I'd be like, actually, you know, I think it's pronounced top sales. It's um, yeah, a lot of these words to do with sailing, uh, navigation, they, they don't run the way that you would think uh, kind of. It's a dialect into itself, like the forecastle of a ship is actually pronounced folksal, that sort of thing. So there's a heritage there. And my student was like, wow, you know so much. Like, yeah, yeah, well, you know, I was cheating. <laughs> but then I also, you know, later in the lesson, I um, held my hands up and I said, listen, I don't know all of these words myself. Uh, Terpsichore, I don't know. 
Uh, there was another one that was a Greek reference, the Psyche. You know, back in the 1920s, it was expected that you'd know a little bit about Greek history if you were to be considered educated. So dropping these words in is completely normal. It's completely to be expected. So we found it an interesting experience to go through. And because it was a homework for the student, she was very happy that we'd, we'd done it in the first place so that she could hopefully get a good mark in her homework. Um, whether I would use it in my own classes beyond that, maybe C1, C2, if I wanted to, to do some kind of, not exactly pronunciation practice, because as I've said, it's not really pronunciation practice, but it is fun and it is a bit unusual. So I think maybe it would be interesting. There are certain aspects of the language that come out here as well, that you can use as a discussion with your students. And that might be even more profitable, which would be, I suppose, one discussion point would be, uh, why are there so many irregular spellings and pronunciation in English? And that kind of leads into the history of the language a little bit. And that can help students to understand where words and their spelling come from and make it more memorable. They will be able to then avoid mistakes in the future. But you can also look at this in terms of the poetry about the idea that these are rhyming couplets. And when I saw, um, I won't plague you, blah, 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 ague, ague is a word that I've only ever seen written. And a lot of people are like me, that they will have encountered language in the written form exclusively. I think I saw ague in the book I'm reading at the moment by Edgar Allan Poe. I mean, that's going back at least a hundred years as well, isn't it? Maybe more. Um, so when you encounter words that you've only seen in writing, it's very natural to not know the correct pronunciation. So I found it enlightening that way. But because it was a rhyming couplet, I was able to look at the previous line and that became a crutch. That was the help that I needed so that I could get the right pronunciation on the next one. And actually this, this kind of leads into Shakespeare, if anything, because a lot of the language of Shakespeare's time has changed uh, in terms of the pronunciation and some spelling forms as well. And we only know how that language of the, um, the 1600s was pronounced because of people like Shakespeare who wrote sonnets and rhyming couplets in their plays and everything like that and were basically recording the sound of the language that way. It's quite useful that they didn't tend to go in for blank verse or modern poetry because then we would have no clue. There's a fascinating um, video I found on YouTube elsewhere with um, David uh, Crystal and his son, Ben Crystal, they're talking about this aspect. I think it was in a BBC documentary or something. So I'll post the link in the description as well. But it's really interesting where they were bringing examples out of um, the original Shakespeare and the pronunciation there and compare it to the more modern interpretation. So there's a lot here that could be used as um, a, a launching pad for a, a bigger discussion of the language whether this poem is a good thing or not, that could be a, a, a matter for discussion as well. So there's a lot that you could do with the poem. So overall, I would say it's probably worth having in the classroom. Okay, so there you go. Some thoughts on the chaos poem, uh, my reading of it. You probably noticed one or two mistakes or a few words that you would say differently. If you did, please um, pop a comment in at the bottom. I'd be very happy to to have a look at that myself and <laughs> apologize for the mistakes. So until next time, take care.